for the Sewing Connection, Series 15, Program 7. If you haven't been to Santa Fe, what do you envision? Dry desert and sand and sun? Well, I've been there and there were flowers everywhere. The hollyhocks were glorious and flowers bloomed in gardens spilling over balconies. And we'll spill a few on fabric. First, let's look at some models to get some flowery ideas from them. The first jacket that we're going to see is by Virginia Simpson. And she's an artist in Sacramento, California, who teaches some uh, classes there on wearable art. And that jacket is just really pretty with Japanese geishas and various fabrics pieced together. There are flowers added to it. And uh, she has named it Beautiful Flower, in fact. So here's one idea for impressionistic flowers, not real ones. Then we have another lovely thing. This is just gorgeous. It's by Nancy Fournier of Brownsville, Maryland. And what she has done is cut strips of silk, painted silk, and then just look at those flowers on the shoulder. We're going to do some of those. And uh, again, impressionistic, burned silk is what it is. Uh, so that one you might uh, earmark and decide, yeah, I, want, I might want to do that. Now some flowers are much more realistic looking, such as these from Carol Jones of Tarpon Springs, Florida. And actually this is not quite a picture of Tarpon Springs. It looks to me like it might be Nashville instead as the model turns around and you can see the whole thing. But these are realistic flowers and then with the guitar and so the music, it must be Nashville. Okay, we might also do some of those flowers. And then this is from Marion Fries of Sacramento. And look at all these flowers. What she has done is paint them with thread. And uh, that we might do also. We'll see how much we have time for today. But first of all, I want to show you how those ribbon flowers were made on that uh, vest that looked like um, Nashville. Now she had a couple of them. She had some of ribbon and it might be wired ribbon or it might be just soft ribbon as this is. But what she has done to it is on one edge of it, she has stitched just big stitches, straight stitches, so that you pull a thread and then you simply wrap that flower round and round. Don't pull it too tight or it ruffles too much. And so then it's just wrapped round and round. And by the time you get a good amount of it there, it does indeed look like a flower of some sort, probably a rose. So that's one way. She also has some there that are bias cut fabric. It's folded in half and then the two raw edges are stitched together. And this also makes a really pretty look. Pull the other one, pull the other end. Uh, this makes a really pretty look when you gather this up a little bit and roll it the very same way. But you can see because of the thickness of the fabric and the fold on the edge, it makes a slightly different uh, type of flower. So again, very pretty to just have small buds like this or a full, full bloomed rose by winding up many, many times and uh, having a lot more. Well, some more flowers that you saw, those burned silk ones. I had this uh, this silk, this painted silk that I bought from an artist, oh, a year or so ago. And I wanted to make something really special out of it because it's just gorgeous fabric and you don't want to waste it on something ordinary. So my first thought when I bought it, I had enough here for a blouse and that's what I thought I would probably make. But blouses, oh, they kind of get lost with all the blouses. They aren't that important an article in most cases. So to me, an important article is a jacket or it's whatever's on the outside. So I decided, no, I'm going to make a jacket instead. But I was really inspired when I saw the vest. And so this is what I've done, started mine. Now this is from my usual um, uh, patterner that I always start with, just a basic. And what I've done is just add a big flare here to the front instead of having the high round neckline. And other than that, nothing's changed much. It's pretty much the same. But what I've done is put this on flannel. So I cut out all those shapes, first of all, in flannel. And this is one of those quilt as you go type techniques where you first cut the stripes of fabric. And I thought these would look best 
if they were from different areas of the fabric. And actually, I just, I haven't cut much yet. I think I can not only make a jacket, but maybe something else out of that. Because when you cut it up like this, of course, you use every little bit. You don't have to worry about odd shapes. And then in one corner, you have a lot of extra. That won't happen. So what I have done is cut these up. And these, whether they're long or short, the long ones especially, I'll put down first. And I just want to make sure, first of all, to cut these the length of the garment so that I can lay it there. And after I have one laid, I'll put another one on top of it, right sides together, and go ahead and stitch a little shallow seam there and then flip it over. And you press that and then you put another one on, stitch and flip. And just keep doing that so it goes really, really fast. Cut yourself several strips first. And then it's amazing with painted fabric like this, even if those strips were cut right next to each other, by the time you put one of them right side up, put the next one upside down, the colors look completely different because of the little splotchy look uh, that's there in that painted silk. So once this is all done, then when I get the jacket actually constructed, all put together, then I'm going to put some flowers on the shoulder just as those you saw uh, that Nancy had done. Well, here's how these flowers can be done. And they're really fun. And uh, they're very easy. I'm just going to get a little fire burning here. And then we'll be ready to go. And uh, here I already have a few petals done, but let me cut it out from scratch and show you how. Now, don't make these too regular. Don't make them too perfect. Because part of the appeal is the fact that they're just cut in, oh, kind of little funny shapes here and there. You might have them come to a big point or you might have them rounded off. But they're just sort of wavy little lines that you cut and you really don't waste much of anything. Use this, cut these last after you've cut out other things because you want to use the little scraps of leftover silk for this. Now the fact that we're going to burn it, it's a good idea to hold it with tweezers. And uh, if it, I also have it in this uh, aluminum uh, plate because if uh, it starts on fire, then you can just drop it in that pie plate. You could even put water in it if you wanted to to put it out. But typically, silk isn't going to flame up. It's just going to kind of scorch around the edges. That's what we want it to do. Silk is good for that because if you would do this with a polyester or any of the synthetics, they are likely to flame, but also they melt. And if you catch anything on fire, uh, just drop it in the plate right away. Do not wave it around because if it's a synthetic and some of that melts, you could splash that molten uh, liquid around. So be careful. But can you see as I put it near the flame, it doesn't actually burn, but it does scorch the edges very nicely. And it's a pretty look. And what it also does besides scorching the edge, and that time I got some wax on it. So I wouldn't really use that or else I'd trim it off because it isn't going to be pretty with that wax on. I actually touched the candle, so you have to be careful about that. I would instead just want to stay away. I only want it scorched. And after you have this all scorched, and I'll just get another uh, peddler. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll cut that one off. I'll get the wax off because we don't want to waste any of this gorgeous silk. Okay, so I'll just cut that much of it off and go ahead and do a little bit more scorching. And then after you have it all finished, whatever size it is, you might do a variety of sizes too. Some of these petals large and some small. And uh, you always know silk because it smells like your hair is being singed. It's an animal fiber, same as your hair. And uh, therefore, it smells about the same. Well, after you have this done, maybe let it cool by dropping it in the plate. Or I am, it's cool already, really. And uh, you might flake off the extra that's here if there is any loose ash there. And then uh, after that's finished, to make sure I don't have anything else left that could rub on my garment, I'm going to just put it in a towel. And uh, with it on a towel, just rub off any of those uh, ash edges that are there. And you've got a petal. And after you have a whole lot of those petals, because I have a whole collection of them here by now, then I am going to just scatter them on the garment however I want to and play with these a little bit to see what looks best. And do vary the sizes and the colors. Here's a round one. There was a long one. And isn't this pretty the way it interplays with uh, the silk that's already there? So I'm looking at the sides because this is charmeuse and one side is matte and the other side is shiny. I'm getting the shiny side up. And you might throw in a little accent. Now this isn't the same piece of silk. And every piece I found burns a little differently. And when this was just a solid color silk left over from a blouse. But as I put this in, it tended to uh, 
change color a little bit around the edge. It's just slightly orangey there, right at the edge of the magenta before the ash is on the edge. But see how easily you could do this? Anyone can be artistic when you do things like this because they're just irregular shapes. It doesn't matter how you cut them. Just do a variety of sizes and shapes. And the fact that that looks a little burned, I like that. I like the variety it lends to and the little bit of extra character. But I might put this here and going over the back shoulder, I'll sew the jacket together first before I do this. And then as I sew these on, I might just sew them on by dropping a few beads down. And as I sew the beads on by hand, because these really have little, they're real irregular beads, and they have just little tiny openings, and they're kind of variegated colors. But as I drop these on, um, that will hold down the flowers as well as just giving it the look of little dew drops or whatever. So remember that technique. Everybody can do that beautifully. No talent needed, and it really comes out looking very, very pretty. Well, I said I saw hollyhocks in uh, Santa Fe, and I did indeed. I like to get inspiration from paintings, so I, very, I have several paintings around my sewing room, and I change them now, and then I trade them around other parts of the house. But this hollyhock painting I got in Santa Fe, and it immediately suggested flowery uh, fabric of hollyhocks to me, so down here on the table I have some of these going. Now here again is where you don't need to have any artistic ability whatsoever, honest, none. All I am doing with this fabric in order to make these hollyhocks, which don't look too much different from those that are painted on the painting or from real ones, except these are strictly impressionistic. This is for the non-artist. And if you want a lot of these, this takes a little while to do. I found the perfect way to do it. I like to catch my husband when he's watching a sporting event on television and just hand him something and he will absentmindedly just do it for hours if I need to have some tedious job done. So that's what happened with this. And it was at the beginning of a game that was going to last all afternoon. Well, by the end of the afternoon, I had all my flowers all ready to go for me to then play with. And what he had was the biggest mess in the world. Happily. He had the presence of mind to, because uh, some of this silk as he was raveling it out would kind of stick to his fingers, so he had the presence of mind to put paper towels there, and as he'd ravel all one color, he would just uh, uh, get a lot of uh, the ravelings down on a paper towel to get them off his hands, so he had them all color sorted, which he didn't even think about doing, but that's the way it turned out. I'll tell you what you do with the ravelings later. Well, anyway, the easy way to do this is take a strip of fabric, first of all. Don't cut up the little squares originally. Start out with the strip. And the reason that's easier is because if you have a strip of it, decide what your final square size is going to be. And here again, vary the sizes. Don't make them all the same. But if some of them are going to be bigger or smaller, decide what your strip is going to be or your square and cut a strip that size and ravel all the edges off first of these two and then cut them into squares and ravel it the other way. It makes a faster job. Now, he struggled with this a while, and he said, is there anything easier you have to ravel? So what I came up with is all of the, these just thin, very thin silks, and they just ravel when you look at them. They really ravel easily, so they were just great. And they're all these wonderful, vibrant colors, so they seem to be perfect. So you can see they're just squares raveled out. And so what I did is I placed those there because I wanted not a square-looking flower but a round one. I put two uh, these squares together so that one would be on the diagonal and then just place them on the hollyhock stems. Now what I made that stem with was a miracle stitcher you've seen me use several times and it's using just any kind of yarn. This is a variegated yarn because I thought okay that'd make a nice base and it's just a matter of couching that on with monofilament thread until I'd get up near the top here and then I'd couch around one place and then I'd couch around another and so on. So it looks like buds up here at the top just like hollyhocks would look. So you can get a really natural look there without, as I said, any talent, any capabilities. Everybody can do this. And I like to hit on that. I like to make things in all my programs that everybody can do. And so this is one of those things. Well, anyway, once you get these flowers arranged here and there and get different colors in, get them all varied, and uh, think about where they're going to be located. I was practicing first on the back of the vest to see what I could do with it. 
uh, because that isn't going to be as important maybe as the front of the vest. So practice on the back and get your tr technique perfected and then move to the front. And this vest also is just the one that I keep making over and over again because uh, most vests look pretty much the same. It's made from the patterner just with uh, the arm size cut out a little bit deeper. But anyway, you decide where you want these. And if you're going to have all one flower growing up one stem and all of a different color flower growing up a different stem, think about that too if it matters to you. And if it doesn't matter, maybe you want to just mix them up every which way. But once you have them placed, then put a couple of pins in to hold them. And then you can just go over the machine and sew them down. Now this sewing down also takes no talent whatsoever. Give me a purple flower over here on a different stem and I'll go sew these. Okay, this is the front and it better look all right because uh, once I have them sewn, they're gonna stay here. Okay, so I'll just pin each of these down so I can pick it up. And uh, anytime you like to do something of this sort but can't do something that really looks naturalistic, then go impressionistic this way. This is the way everybody can do it well. Now notice what I've done in the middle of those flowers. I've simply stitched around uh, in circles to see what would happen and uh, make a little center for the flower. Now if you want these flowers to really look realistic or more so than this, maybe give them yellow centers. I didn't. It didn't matter to me. So what I have on right now is just pink center I'm going to put on it because it kind of blends with any of these colors that I'm using. And I need to have that on zigzag and I need to drop the feed dog, which it already is, and I need to have a darning foot on here because I'm going to go in any which direction. Now this fabric is going to be stitched easily because it already has an interfacing fused to the back side of it. So it's firm enough that I'm not going to need to put it in a hoop or put any uh, stabilizer behind it. It'll work just fine this way. So it's just a matter of doing a little stitching and once it gets going, uh, move it around and the machine's telling me, do you know you have the feed dog down? And yes, I know that. And I think instead I'm going to put it back on straight stitch and do it that way because I just want to go around in circles. And actually I'm going to possibly take this thread out and put some darker thread out in it because this one maybe shows a little bit too much and so I won't do this a lot but you can see how easy that is for goodness sake. It's just going around in circles, just free motion stitching. If your fabric is thin enough and if it isn't firm enough that you can do this easily, then it might be a good idea for you to put it in a hoop or else put some stabilizer under it. But you can see it's something you can do successfully. Here I have the other side of the back and here I also have my flowers growing. And you can see how I did kind of keep one color on one stem and put the bright red on another stem and these on another. So I did and I noticed that one of my iridescent flowers had, or my fabrics, had black going one way and that bright pink the other way. And, oh well, that's okay. So they aren't supposed to look real anyway, necessarily. But I like the look of this. When I looked at the painting and, and they were kind of luminescent, they, they just looked like um, they might feather out like this. Well, I said I might show you something different that you could do with all those ravelings because I don't want to throw those away either. They just could be valuable and I'll leave this here so I can rip it out easier. I'll leave long tail on it. Um, but uh, I told you that when John was doing this, he had all these paper towels to rub off the extra fibers on. So as I was getting ready to throw those stacks of them away, because you can see what a mess it is, it kind of static, uh, holds it all together there and I have various colors between the layers. But as I looked at that, I thought, oh, you know, that almost paints a picture in itself. And here again, no talent needed. So what I have done with all those ravelings is uh, try it out on a scrap first because you don't know what's going to result. But I first of all tried it in white because I thought, oh, that'd be pretty to have something summery looking, maybe to wear some sort of an evening thing. And I thought it killed it. It really didn't even show up that much when it was on this uh, white. So go the reverse and look what happens in black. Doesn't that look alive because uh, it really shows up even though the white obscured it, the black does not. So I thought, okay, how am I actually going to do this? And here's how I have done it. 
I've put a layer of actually just t-shirt interlock, just cotton interlock is what I have as the base on the bottom because I just needed something dark. It didn't matter what. Now you could make this transparent if you want to. There's no reason why you can't just do it between two transparent layers and wear it that way. If you'd like a jacket or something dressy, that would be all right. I really didn't want it transparent, so I went ahead and put mine on that uh, t-shirt interlock and back. And then on top of that, uh, I cut in the shape of a vest or a jacket. What am I making? I'm making a vest out of this one, I think. I don't see sleeves over here, so I think I'll stop with the vest. Uh, I could, though, add sleeves to it. So remember that anytime you're making a vest, uh, it is possible to add sleeves. There was a program way back that I did a, several programs ago where sleeves were just added to a vest to make a jacket very nicely. Well, anyway, what I have is a fusible. So just a sheer fusible, fusible side up. I put that on top of my t-shirt. And then I just took little groups of this yarn, this, these ravelings. And if you just put groups down here, and it kind of paints a picture, and then I'll get a bunch of the purple ones, and I'll put them all together over here. And very quickly, you have these looking a little flowery because it does paint a picture because of the different colors that you have there. So here again, everybody can do this, and it's really fun. Don't throw those ravelings away. Do something of this sort. I even have a friend who likes to take the lint out of her dryer basket, and uh, if she does different color batches and do things with that similar to this, so it's another possibility. Well, I am going to change thread to do this because uh, the one I have in right now is just too light a pink, and I don't think I want it on this. So I'll real quickly change this thread, and then we'll do a little of that stitching because this is where you are going to need a hoop, and this is where you will do a little stipple stitching. So once I have this in, we are also just going to do this on straight stitch, and uh, that stipple stitching is just a matter of going back and forth here and there until you have everything covered and held together. Now, when I originally had this on the ironing board and did a little pressing, and I'll get the needle threader down here so I can pull it through without any problems. And uh, when I had this on the ironing board originally, I did uh, want to fuse those ravelings down, and yet they aren't going to stay down completely, so that's why it's covered with the net on top. A sheer tool is what I have on top of those. But just to hold it temporarily, I wanted a sheer fusible. I already have one of these all done, and uh, this is one of the fronts, I guess, that I have here. And you can see that, maybe you can see, it's all purple stitch there. And uh, you can see perhaps on the back, it's hard to see on the black because I have black under it. Uh, but anyway, it's just stitched here and there and every which way. It doesn't matter what you do with it. Here I have one that is in process, and so I am going to do a little stitching on this. And here's where you do probably want to use a hoop so that it can hold it nicely, very flat, because when you move it around, unless you have a hoop or unless you have really stiff fabric, you just aren't going to get the job done. I'll start here in a corner and... Uh, Get that all tightly in there, and then again, I need to have the uh, uh, feed dog down, and I'm just going to straight stitch this, but keep moving it around. And after I start, I'll stop just so I can clip off this thread so that it won't get stitched over again. And then we'll do a little more of this stitching. Now with this also, it's just moving it round and round, and. Uh, so you can see, it's just making big circles. I have this in a light enough thread that you can see what it looks like. I am also going to rip this out because I really want it to blend in because I don't want to see this thread. Now, if you actually do want to see your thread, think also of the possibility of uh, using metallic threads. That might be pretty or whatever you want, but this is a quick job. You just do it back and forth and you don't have to get every square quarter inch of it. You can just, uh, here and there, it's going to catch generally. It is not going to come apart. And you have built some fabric. You have done something very decorative here. And uh, it's just going to uh, really be something kind of nice, something kind of interesting. Every sewing friend you have is going to ask you, how did you do that? That is uh, just really unique, really different. Okay, well then you saw one jacket that had some thread painting on. Actually, it was a vest, 
and I just want to show you how that can be done also. And uh, here I have some flowers already fused on. And these are some, this is just a, a print fabric with flowers on it. I've put uh, some of the fusible release sheet, the um, a fusible web on the back side of it, cut it out after I had that fusible web on, and uh, then fused it on here. Now before you fuse it on, try this vest on to see exactly where it's going to hit because you don't want those to fall in awkward places. And also you might want to equalize it, I don't. And so I'm going to, on mine, make one side going all the way up and down. Maybe on the other side it'll just be in the lower part, in back it'll be somewhere uh, other way. Uh, don't fill it too full. You have to know when to stop. So that's kind of a problem with a lot of these things because you have such fun doing it that it's hard to stop when it's, uh, it should be. Don't overdo. Okay, well with this, it also needs to be put in a hoop. And this is thread painting. And uh, the tip I got from somebody who does a lot of this, travels internationally and does it, uh, Sherry Dawn Roberts, her name is, and she was saying, here, I'll just put it down where I already started and do a little bit more of this. She was saying, if you're going to do any of this thread painting, you want it to look very natural. So you want it to go right in with the way the leaf grows or whatever the flower petal is or whatever you're doing. So make sure the direction of it as you zigzag back and forth does go in the right way so that it looks nice. Practice it first and it's going to come out just beautifully. Well, flowers are a lot of fun to do. Uh, we've done a flower show before. They were all different flowers. These are completely different than I did last time. And doing flowers is endless, and I keep getting letters from you saying, let's do some more flowers. What are some other ways? So here you've had some more flowers. And uh, think of some ways of your own. Go out and look at a garden or look at a flowery painting and get some good ideas that inspire you to do a technique that maybe I haven't even done yet. Well, wherever you are, bloom where you're planted. Enrich your life by contributing those special qualities that only you have to give. We all can do more than we really think we can, and next time, we're going to take a basic pattern and design anything we want, okay?